Hello, fools. I'm Deidre Willard. I'm here today with Oliver Franklin Wallace. He's currently the features editor of British GQ. He's an award-winning magazine journalist. His new book, Wasteland, explores the thing that we probably don't want to think about, trash and where it goes. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. One of the lines you had about midway through the book that really stuck with me was about how little of we see of the way things are made and how little we understand of the true cost. So why was it important for you to tell these stories? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, the, the thing that struck me from the outset of this journey is that you know we spend, as a society, a lot of time talking about where stuff comes from, right? We, we care about whether things are all organic, whether they're free trade and air miles and all these kind of things that we kind of think about with our purchases. But we spend or historically have spent much less energy thinking about where it goes afterwards. But, you know, as I kind of explore in this book, quite often these days in this kind of global economy, that journey is just as long. And the, and there are a huge number of uh, variations in, in where your things end up. Quite often, uh, you know, things are getting loaded on container ships and going halfway around the world before they're being disposed of. And the impact is is quite profound, actually. So, you know, I, I use the example of the solid waste uh, industry is estimated to be about 5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Food waste, which is calculated separately, is thought to be 8 to 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions, according to the IPCC. So those two figures together give make it, you know, the waste uh, is, is a huge environmental challenge before we start talking about why the ocean is full of plastic and or, and the, those kind of the, the tangible uh, uh, elements of the pollution that we kind of see in our in our everyday lives. So the thing that kind of fascinated me was like, okay, well, how did we get to this state where this, the ocean is full of, you know, the Pacific Ocean has a garbage patch, you know, five times the size of Mexico in it. And how, you know, what, what, how did we get here? And a big part of the answer is because we've kind of historically treated waste as something that should be out of sight and out of mind. And as a result, uh, it's something that has kind of you know been on the periphery and my hope is that this kind of book can, can start a conversation an ongoing conversation I, sh I should say because you know over the last few years as i've been kind of reporting this story the level of consciousness around waste and recycling and those kind of things has, has changed hugely um which has been really encouraging but there's still quite a long way to go so hopefully this is kind of a way to kickstart another conversation well one of the things that that you just mentioned is that you know, out of sight, out of mind, right? One of the things that many countries have done for years is export their trash. But the the economics of it, that's kind of shifting. So what are the long term consequences of that when we can't just kind of ship it away from us? Yeah, that's right. So this story really started uh, in 2018 for me, because um, for, for people who don't know, for the past, really for the past two decades, uh, the story of waste has been the story of the growth of China and a lot of the stuff that we were throwing away and particularly things to be recycled, whether that's scrap metals or plastics, was being sent to China, which you know the the, the global industrial hub to be melted down and, and remade. Uh, the problem is is that you know we were sending you know, thousands and thousands of container ships loaded with garbage every year back to China, and often what you we were sending wasn't very high quality. So it was, you know, the things were mixed badly, and or it was dirty and essentially unusable. Um, partly because of what we talked about, you know, like no one was really checking, and there was this sense that okay, well they, they're not going to send it back, so you can kind of get away with a lot. And what ended up happening was in about 2018, the Chinese government turned around and said, right, we've had enough of this. You're sending too much garbage, like it's polluting our environment. We're producing enough of this stuff locally that we don't really need the materials anymore. And they shut their doors to the international waste trade, more or less. You know, they, they pass these incredibly stringent environmental curbs on what could be, what waste could be imported. And all of a sudden, basically overnight, the entire global like waste economy kind of crashed, and we had, we saw a bunch of waste companies, uh, particularly in places like California and on the West Coast, where there were a lot of exporters going bust. And the waste markets in the international um, uh, waste trade essentially had this kind of panic of, okay, well, what are we going to do with all this raw material? And it ended up flooding places like Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand. And in the intervening years has been a story of essentially kind of whack-a-mole because, you know, plastics will flood into a into a country like Vietnam or in, or Thailand and kind of overwhelm the waste management system there. 
and uh, until, until they've passed bans. So, it, so it's a, a, a series of countries now have have banned waste imports. Um, so the, re the result in the global north and in, and in the west has essentially been it's kind of galvanized a sudden reinvestment in our waste infrastructure. You know, in, in the UK, for example, where I am right now, there's been a huge, like a, a series of big waste reforms. There's been big investment by large waste companies in building new uh, recycling facilities, for example. Because at the same time as the, as the waste market has crashed, we've had this huge kind of environmental awakening among consumers about the impact of, of our waste and our, our carbon footprints, and particularly the impact of plastics on the oceans. So all of a sudden, people are you know choosing to buy recyclables more and recycle plastics more. It's become very desirable for companies to include recycled plastics in their products. In some countries now, like the UK, it, it, is, le it is legally mandated to have a certain quantity of recycled plastics now in, in packaging in the UK. So you kind of have these two competing um, you know, forces and the result has been a, a kind of upheaval in the waste industry that that is kind of quite remarkable and, and a level of change and upheaval and, and innovation that has been a long time coming. So it's a very exciting space, but there's been a lot of upheaval in a short period of time. Well, and I think one of the things that, that you sort of highlighted there is that consumers are aware. We we want to do better. And we have this, this interesting relationship with recycling. We, we want to recycle, but we don't want to do a lot of work when it comes to, to our recycling. And one of the things you talk about in the book is the problem of objects that are made out of multiple recyclable materials. So it can be like a label on a bottle, or it can be as complicated as electronics. Some products, it seems like maybe that could be simplified like with a bottle. Maybe you don't need a paper label or something like that. Others really like electronics just can't. So how big is the separating part of this business? And is that is that where one of the growth areas? Oh, I mean, separating is is, is the whole ball game. Like you've, you've, you kind of really hit on on the crucial thing there because you're right when depending on where you are and, and waste is such a it's such a fragmented thing. It's so local. You know, if I talk to someone in New York versus someone who lives in Austin or someone like that, there's chances that their, you know, their their relationship with their waste is totally different. Um, and same with the UK. I live in a in a, a very recycling focused household. I think we have seven different types of bin. You know, like <laughs> so, 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 so you know, we're doing a lot of sort of paper goes in one, and card and the you know, metals and glass and all this kind of stuff. Um, but that's that's the whole ball game, right? The, the to 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 waste companies, what we're dealing with is raw materials, and they know that the market for cardboard and copper and aluminum and glass are all wildly different things, different recycling rates, different levels of prof profitability. So for a long time, the kind of onus has been on these, wa these waste companies uh, to do the separation for, for you. So for example, in, in the start of the book, I followed... Um, the, like waste collection, you know, the, the garbage truck, when you throw something away, particularly when you throw away recycling, which will, most of what we're going to talk about um, here is it will go off to a big facility um, called a materials recovery facility or a MRF. Uh, they call them as, uh, and, and essentially they're like these huge mechanized, they're almost like um, a manufacturing line in reverse. Okay. So they're, they're like sort of taking away the cards and the metals and they've got these giant machines full of fans and magnets to essentially shred things and kind of separate all these materials away to try and find what's valuable like the treasure in the the treasure in the trash one man's trash is, a, is another man's treasure is the is the, is the famous uh, old english saying um but the truth is that the way of doing this is, is has historically been quite crude like a lot of the time um if you know if i showed you a yogurt pot and a coke bottle a lot of people would, would maybe not realize that those things are made of two different types of plastics and you, you can't just like melt them down and mix them together. So it's all in separation and sorting, as you say. And historically, that has been done crudely by hand. So you will go into these places, there'll be conveyor belts full, full of people and their job will be to, you know, they'll be assigned, okay, you're, you're picking out cans today and their job is the waste rolls past on the conveyor and they're you know picking off cans by the thousand and that's their job right their job is to is to find those materials what's happened more recently is is these processes are being mechanized you're now getting kind of ai powered robots these, these robot arms that can kind of you know been trained to spot different things and they're kind of suckering them up with these little plastic arms and stuff which is kind of amazing to see 
Um, but yeah, the, the the innovation in this space has been huge. And you know, I, I write about a couple of these companies um, in the book. But there's this real onus now of on companies to a separate the waste better, but b as as you said, is like come up with materials that, and particularly come up with things like packaging that aren't. 12 materials mixed together because that you know ultimately they were going to throw it in landfill so nobody was really thinking about it but finding ways to make them of one material so that they can be circular at the end of their life a good example I'll, in fact i can literally show you a prop here here is a plastic coke bottle in the uk and so for example they now have a little thing which keeps the lid on so that the lid isn't separated and the reason is is because the lids are now made of the same plastic as the rest of the bottle so you can put that whole thing in the recycling and they will recover 100% of it instead of losing the percent that was to lids because that to them is valuable. So you're seeing those kind of little things happening everywhere and the result is is kind of hopefully a big change. Interesting. Yeah, we, we don't have that innovation yet in, in <laughs> the US. Yet. I'm sure it's coming. Well, I, I want to dive into that role of the sorter a little bit because you in the book, you go to the garbage hills of India and Malaysia, and, and but you also go to places like thrift stores and the sorters, they have this incredible knowledge base. So is it really possible to mechanize uh, at scale when when it, there's so many little fiddly things like the sorters in thrift stores can just feel the fabric and know, know different things and put them in different piles? Yeah, and, and, and it, it is an incredible skill and you know something that I, uh, I am kind of almost evangelical about now. You go to, um, you, know, you mentioned India. So for the book, I went to New Delhi, which is the capital of, of India, um, to write about waste pickers there. Waste pickers are people who basically make their living sorting garbage and, and p- picking up the, the things that are valuable. So for them, they're hunting for metals and different kinds of plastics and things like that. And the thing that's amazing is that, as you said, that they are they are incredibly skilled at what they do. And we, we talk about plastic as if it's one thing, but plastics are actually, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, many different types. And they can quite often tell just by the feel or the weight or like the texture like the different levels of slipperiness what a thing is so they can kind of sort through this stuff at incredible speed and they will know you know because it's their job it's their livelihood they know the value of different metals and therefore when they're taking apart electronics what's valuable and what's not and so they they have this relationship with their stuff that sees the value in it and i think that's such an important um thing for us that we that we could all really understand like if you understood how difficult it is to get lithium out the ground then people would probably wouldn't be so cavalier about throwing away their disposable vapes or you know their their old smartphones you know if you understood if you saw when you see footage of the you know the devastation that happens with strip mining in order to get cobalt and all of these other metals out the ground like it, it really changes your perception of of the value of things anyway so that's coming to slightly slightly off topic but um yeah I th- when, when it comes to the value of um what waste pickers can do a lot of it is memory you know it's it, it's 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 tactile it's visual it's all of these things and it's quite hard to teach computers to do that why it's why, which is why historic why, why historically it's been done by hand that is happening because of machine learning and ai like you are able to do now the, the, the pick rate of some of this machinery is in, is incredibly like their success rate is is very high um it's not perfect but in one of the rea- the, the one of the cruel realities about the the way that the economy is set up around waste is that you know it's, it's never particularly profitable people who pick waste for a living are some of the poorest people in the world uh, and so if you can find ways to mechanize away this this stuff then then people tend to um so yeah it's 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 a kind of a fascinating world and and to see through their eyes has been an incredible part of this 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 journey to kind of, it, it gives you a whole different relationship to the things that you consume i think yeah i think that's one of the lessons i took away from the book is that is that really is just reducing what you what you consume is is kind of kind of the core thing and that's it's hard though we've got such a consumer economy and one of the things people do especially with fast fashion is they say well i'm going to donate so it's fine if i buy plenty of clothes cuz it's circular economy i'm going to donate it's not quite that simple though what should we know about the global economy about resale well resale again it's something that we don't really want to talk about Uh, when you when i just i I describe thrift stores and goodwills we call them charity shops here they're all essentially the same thing you know they're an altruistic thing you know we we think we're doing something nice nice for the world and for people which is which is broadly true 
but people don't really see thrift stores as part of the waste system, which is what they are. You know, there are some that, that you put things that you don't want there, and they magically disappear, and they you know they go off into this secondhand economy, which is a thriving essential part of the global economy. There are huge parts of the global south that you know all of the, the electronics and clothing and all of these things you know are all secondhand or, or largely secondhand. And the example I use is is clothing because, as you say. What what we've seen in the last couple of decades is this incredible explosion in fast fashion. We now own many, many like per person, many, many times more clothing than our grand pieces of clothing than our grandparents would. It lasts a lot less time. You know, it's it's poorer quality. It's also designed to to not last very long. Um, and so what what's ended up happening is that the places where our second hand clothing is going so for example i followed a lot of the uk exports go to west africa so i went to um accra which is the capital of ghana which is kind of like the sorting hub for a lot of that that part of west africa it's where the the, the primary um export market and the they have just been inundated with with clothing essentially you know th- there is there is too much for them to process there is not a, and the stuff that they're getting sent is of lower and lower quality so the side effect has been basically that their waste management system is being flooded by our cast offs and i would it was kind of galling to me to see the stuff that people donate and some some of it's high quality but a lot of the times people are throwing away the stuff that's ripped or it's stained or you know like it's something that you wouldn't buy and we have this slightly uncomfortable notion that even if we wouldn't wear it maybe there's someone in the global south who's like much worse off than us who who would and it's kind of i don't think it's a, a very fair attitude to people people still have standards and pride in what they what they want to wear in in ghana and elsewhere um so the reality is you know i write about this in the book for example that um accra had one sanitary landfill that was paid for for by a loan from the world bank and it was designed to last i think about 30 years and it filled up in three and a half and once it was full of our clothing, uh, these clothing, this clothing is quite often made of of plastic or you know petrochemical fibers these days, and it caught fire and it burned to the ground. So the head of the waste uh, management department of the of the city of Accra cried when he told me that the people of Accra will be paying interest on this landfill that burned to the ground for the next you know twenty years, and these are you know people that are a lot worse off than you and I, you know, people living in quite often informal settlements and slums. So it's hard, you know, it, it, it is it is hard to have that conversation because people are trying to do their best. And you have this kind of opportunistic middle layer of, of trades people and, and this this market, which is, you know, treating waste as an externality, you know, so so often in business, and in life, we treat waste as something that's kind of external to us and, and it's often inflicted on other people it's inflicted upon the margins and upon the marginalized um, and that's something that's true whatever we throw away it always ends up not only at, in a place but you know on a on a person on a, on people and so i want to kind of make people aware of of those kinds of side effects and um, where it's going and to talk about how we can fix it one of the things that i think one of the ways that we're all more aware right now is about the uh, PFAS chemicals, the so the polyfluoral uh, forever chemicals. Uh, in the U.S. here, we've had uh, you know a couple of big uh, settlements with 3M and Dow Chemical, and there's been water testing of knowing that these chemicals that are used in like nonstick cookware and things like that, they're now in our in our water supply. So. What are the PFAS chemicals and why are they such a big concern? Yeah, P- uh, PFAs, as I call them, the PFAS is probably correct. the correct terminology. It's not something that you kind of talk talk aloud with uh, a lot of people. So it's interesting to hear different pronunciations. Um, or as you say, you know, a, a class of nonstick chemicals. And for a long time, they were in everything. You know, they were in things like fire retardant foam and also pizza boxes and also, you know, nonstick pans and, you know, going back decades. And there has been really quite strong evidence for many decades that the industry knew, but more publicly for the last decade or so, that these chemicals are very toxic, highly toxic um, carcinogens and have other other side effects as well. They're not good for us. And this, you know, I don't want to say anything that's legally contentious, but uh, the, 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 the short form of it is that several companies were found to have known that they were bad and still produce them anyway and that has now stopped and there's been a lot of um dis uh what's the word 
uh, disassoci- companies disassociating themselves from from these chemicals and and winding it down. Uh, and there's several ongoing cases, both in the US, Europe, and around the world, of people trying to, I guess, get um, get en- environmental and financial justice for the manufacturer and their exposure, uh, the exposure to these chemicals at the manufacturing sites. Um, but yeah, I mean, what what can I say other than uh, the story of of toxic chemicals is is a kind of one of the wildest parts of the book because when you talk about the number of chemicals that we are exposed to in everyday life you would assume or maybe i na- somewhat naively assumed that you know things wouldn't be put onto the market unless we know they were relatively safe and uh the reality is uh the, the, the kind of short history and this is massively oversimplified um, but I'll give you a slightly, uh, like slightly oversimplified potted history of, of toxic chemicals, is that um, when the first legislation around toxic chemicals was kind of being written in the 1970s, there were already too many things on the market uh, for for them to go away and test everything and, and kind of do it on a on a one by one basis. So they grant what the term is they grandfathered in tens of thousands of, of chemicals and basically said, okay, every, anything that's kind of already in circulation that we don't think is is you know toxic is fine. You get a free pass. And only since then has there really been, you know, the, the kind of rigorous standards we would expect now. And even then, like chemical testing is uh, it, it, it's not very like What's the, what, I don't, what, I'm trying to be careful about my wording. Um, there has been many examples of chemicals passing the test initially, only for us to later learn that they were doing bad things to us. I give the example of like BPA, but, but bisphenol A, which is in plastic, used to be in kind of lots of kids' toys and baby bottles and things, and is now a uh, banned toxic carcinogen. And there are similar, several other um, chemicals in that group. If you think about um, pesticides, you know, there are whole classes of pesticides that used to be freely sprayed in the 60s, DDT, things like that, which now, you know, no one would go near, although they're still, in, you were, until very recently, some of those were used in gigantic economies like India freely. Um, so you, we've ended up in this world where, like, there's a huge amount of toxicity out there that we're still trying to understand. The PFAs is one where it is so ubiquitous, you know, in our life, in our drinking water, Things like that that we that we really don't understand what its what its health effects are. Um, it's clear that the EPA has revised down the safety limits, I think two or three times in the last five years to, to now basically saying there is no safe level of consumption of these chemicals. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it it is it is truly astonishing to me, and I have absolutely no doubt that uh, there will be many many more other chemicals in this class. And ones like it that uh, will will kind of discover similar things in the future. It seems to just be the, the nature of the beast, and the efforts to uh, improve the the way that we test for these chemicals um, are still catching up, even like all these years later. So it, it's a it's a bit of a wild west situation, but it's um, fascinating, slightly scary, to, <laughs> just scary to to report on. I have to say. Yeah, indeed. Well, you mentioned cobalt and lithium earlier, and you had this stat in the book that stuck out to me, which is that only 17.4% of electronic waste is recycled. So we spend a lot of money on our phones and, and you know, we, 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 I think we're starting to use them a little bit longer, but we are still so bad at recycling electronics. How is there any way for us to get better at this? Yeah, so I mean, the the, the good news about that is that you know, electronic waste. We we've kind of went through this incredible glut period of electronic waste because whenever you have a new technology that is kind of really rapidly improving, a smartphone is a classic example. You know, that technology was improving so quickly year on year that people were constantly wanting new ones, and so we were getting new new phones every twelve months or every twenty four months or what, what have you. And the the level of waste, the wastefulness inherent in that is kind of astonishing to think about particularly when you understand the value of of the materials in your smartphone right there's there's not just things like gold and platinum it's cobalt it's neodymium it's like there there are all of these rare metals in there that are incredibly difficult to get to um and so there's real value when we throw them away and for a long time you know this this stuff was essentially disappearing it was going in landfills or it's going in you know your kitchen drawer or the back of a cupboard somewhere 
and so we don't really know the end fate of a lot of a lot of this material. Now we're in a in a situation where you know tech companies and governments have, have kind of realized the value locked away there, and so there's a lot more focus on recycled content. And you see companies like Apple doing interesting things um, with e waste recycling. That one of my kind of uh, most surreal moments in the in the reporting of the book was I went to um, write about ERI, which is one of the biggest uh, recycling electronics recycling firms in America. I went out to their big plant in Fresno. And you go into these places, and again, it's it's essentially like, if I don't want to oversimplify thing, but it's like the most gigantic blender you've ever seen. Uh, you know, it, it's a it's a <laughs> a disassembly line, and they go through these things, and they're kind of crushed and then shredded, and all of these different kind of magnetic and flotation means of kind of separating out the different materials: the silicon, rare earths, copper. You know, they uh, they have extremely uh like high end ways of separating these materials but a lot to, and then at the other side of things there are like literally guys with like hammers like hammering stuff apart and and like so because when you know when you get some, something the size of a tv there are some stuff that's like literally glued together and so before you can recycle it you have to like tear the glue apart so it's kind of a fascinating um industry to be a part of and yeah the growth is is quite remarkable and the value there is is truly not quite under not quite appreciated yet but it but there's a great statistic in the book which is that there is more gold in a ton of e-waste than there is in a ton of gold ore so you end up with a situation which is what we have now that large mining companies are among those investing in electronic waste and in uh what they call urban mining like which is like essentially land like mining land or mining old landfills eventually to to see what metals can be can be recovered from there because there's so much value that's that's fascinating. So instead of like trying to go dig gold out of the earth, we're now going to try to dig it out of the trash. Well, precisely. And, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because particularly rare metals, you're having to dig insane low amounts of oil. You know, you know, the concentration of of copper ore now when you mine it is much, much lower than it was at its, uh, you know, at the, at the peak of copper mining, for example. So it's getting harder and harder to get this stuff. Meanwhile, we've got you know, huge quantities of it already on the surface, essentially, you know, that we don't have to dig down and find. So so the ability to find this stuff in our landfills or in our kitchen drawers is suddenly very competitive. So which is which is why you can find even now that you can go and, you know, sell those old electronics for, for a decent price and someone will take it off your hand and it will get turned into a new iPhone or, or, or something. And I would encourage everyone to do that uh, if you can, because honestly, if you want to talk about waste, like the mining industry is crazy and uh the the thing that i think shocks people the most is if you understood the discrepancy between industrial waste versus the household waste you know we spend so much time talking about recycling and things we do at home there is one estimate um which i cannot i think i have to credit this um to an academic called max liberon because i read it in, in in his book but i think it comes from old epa data uh, that by weight, which is a very crude measure, ninety-seven percent of all of all waste is industrial waste. And when you consider like how much of that is the petrochemical and the mining industry, and, and it's literally you know weight because it's heavy rock and things. But you know it, it's so overwhelming the the amount of industrial waste that it's almost hard to picture. Um, and a lot of that comes from mining. So if we can find ways to get that out of our old smartphones and, and cut down the amount of mining that we need to do, then you know we'll all be better off. Indeed. Well, last question for you, just sort of, uh, this is an uh, investing in business podcast. And Peter Lynch, who's one of the most famous investors, he had this theory about investing in disgusting things. And <laughs> there's a there's a good business in investing in, in disgusting things like, you know, uh, there's waste management companies. So we talked a lot today about this global economy of shifting things. So broadly speaking, it seems like trash and investing in trash is kind of the future a bit, right? Oh, one hundred percent. And I and I think we should, you know, in the waste industry, they will they would they would say we you know we don't call it waste, we call it materials, and it's just another way of you know getting at raw materials once again. Um, the waste industry has is is you know you're, you're 
is this someone someone described this uh to me and, and he was kind of joking but uh, there's there's some truth in it which which he said and it's to talk about recycling you know it's it's a great business because the stuff comes to us and, and you know people sort it out at home so they do all the labor for us for free you know it's like this <laughs> it's this stuff people are literally throwing away this thing that they think has zero value and they do they, they clean it for you and they you know pre-organize it and it just kind of comes uh which is a grossly a simplifying uh way of saying it but i do think there's some truth in it and you know if you look at the waste market in the us for example the big waste conglomerates um waste management inc and republic services and the kind of market leaders i think there's like four or five companies now that, that have kind of consolidated the market over the last um couple of decades and you know their their performance. You know they they continue to make good money, and the stock price keeps rising, and the the profits seem to be doing pretty well, even despite all of the insane fluctuations. What seems to be pretty clear to me is that as governments find more and more uh, pressure ways to pressure businesses into kind of hitting ESG and net zero targets, waste is like the low hanging fruit in a lot of these cases um, because you know. If you're a company and you reduce your waste, you're you're increasing your profit margins. And if you're a waste business, then you know you 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 want to be able to sell recycled PET, for example. Recycled plastic is now at a premium. Ten years ago, virgin plastic was seen as the thing that you wanted to buy, and recycling recycled plastic was seen as a lower, like a less desirable product. And that's totally flipped now. And the premium on on recycled plastic is much much higher because companies like Nike and whatever, you know, they need it to make recycled trainers to sell to environmentally conscious consumers. So there's been this big flip, which for me, from the outside and from talking to people in the industry seems like a, a huge opportunity for that market. And that's only going to get stronger. The, what, the nice thing about, you know, waste is it's one of the very few truly renewable sources of materials, right? Where there's always going to be people throwing stuff away and the more people there are, the more stuff we throw away. So it's one of the rare areas, like it's like the only commodity market where the supply is increasing, you know? So it's uh, it's it, it's a fun uh, fun thing to think about once you get, if you can get, look past the disgust, there's uh, plenty, of, uh, plenty of exciting things going on. Absolutely. Well, thank you for so much for your time. The book is Wasteland. It's an incredible, thought-provoking read. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.